Hello, and welcome back to the game room. This is the Marshall's Handbook for the current incarnation of the Deadlands game system. It uses the Savage Worlds rule set, and this will need to be a separate purchase for you to run the game system. Now, in the previous video, I talked about the Player's Guide, which gave an overview of the setting and the rules for character creation. This is the Marshall's Handbook, and what it, it is essentially the GM's Guide, if we're talking about any other sort of game system. In Deadlands, it is called the Marshall instead of the GM. Now, this book reveals the secret machinations that are at work behind the scenes in the Deadlands setting, a setting in the weird and wild west, a setting of pulp horror and pulp action. Now, uh, the background will be revealed here, and so know that from this point forward, this should be spoiler territory. So, without further ado, since the dawn of time, the world has been split in the physical world and the spirit realm. The spirit realm is called the hunting grounds, and it is populated by nature spirits who tend to the land, but it is also populated by evil spirits called the Manitou. And these feed upon fear, and their only job is to torment humanity itself. Now the names that we use here um, are different throughout the world. They, there are many different names for the spirit realm and these evil spirits, but since Deadlands is set in the American Wild West, it is the Native American names, such as Hunting Grounds and Manitou, that we use for this setting. These Manitou are sometimes able to spawn abominations, which are monsters that can enter the physical plane, and they seek to sow fear throughout the land, and so the Manitou may collect it. But what is this collection of fear for? It is to feed their dark masters, known only as the Reckoners. Their goal is to bathe the entire planet in fear and horror, and this will one day allow the Reckoners to step forth into the physical realm and rule the entire world as though they were dark gods. And the four Reckoners who have claimed the Western United States are named uh, War, Pestilence, Famine, and Death. There is a heavy Revelations and Doomsday theme in the game of Deadlands, but sitting as the central theme is that of fear. Now it has both in-character and out-of-character uses. You see, in the game, the Manitou are creatures of spirit. Their only ability to, uh, to interact with the physical realm is to sow fear and to feed off of it and to collect it. They can create an abomination after enough fear, but these creatures don't go about devouring entire towns. No, rather they uh, seek to torment a town, leading ghoulish raids here and there, or eating a traveler now and then, so that rumors may spread, so that paranoia may spread, and so that the fear may spread. Because the Manitou depend upon fear, and in devouring an entire settlement, it will give them a single burst of fear, but when they uh, lurk in the shadows and torment humans from afar, this lets them feed upon fear for many years to come. The book also has excellent out-of-character advice for running a game of horror. It's not about slaughtering every player character with a single frothing werewolf, no. It's about turning the screws and amping up that tension and the fear over time. The party might discover some dead settlers. It is rumored that they've been killed by animals, but when they investigate them, they see that the tooth and claw marks are all wrong. It's something they haven't seen before. And then they hear rumors of grave robbing. When they investigate this, they find bones there that have been gnawed upon by something very recently. Then, the next night, they see strange gaunt figures skittering and scattering right outside of their line of sight, right in the shadows. The night after that, some thing grabs one of the player characters and tries to drag them off into the night. Whether it is successful or not, the player characters can then track the strange footprints 
it leads them to perhaps an abandoned mine nearby. If they investigate this, they will then discover to their horror there is an entire subterranean city of ghouls living right outside of town and preying upon the town folk. Now, what will they do? You see, both you, as the marshal of the game, have something in common with the evil spirits that are in the game world. You both want to amp up that tension. You both want to feed that fear, ramping it up and up, turn that knob, until everything ends in the gnashing of teeth, the booming of six guns, and the red spray of arterial bleeding. Now, the first section of the book goes into the history of Deadlands, the secret history, uh, involving the hunting grounds, the Manitou, and the Reckoners. It goes into how a group of Native American shamans, a few hundred years before the setting begins in 1878, had sealed off the hunting grounds in order to protect our world. But, in 1863, a, another shaman named Raven uh, ripped open the hunting grounds and allowed spirits into our world. He killed the shamans that were protecting us, and he alone, well, with about 13 other followers, have ushered in a new apocalyptic age. But more about Raven and his machinations in a bit. Now, the, uh, the next uh, section of the book talks about the western United States. The setting about as far east as it goes is Chicago, and even then there's not too much information there. It focuses on the western United States, and it has been divided into four distinct realms, those realms being war, pestilence, famine, and death. I like that each section of the game sort of has its own theme that you can really play up in your sessions. Now, the realm of war encompasses most of the West. You see, the Civil War is currently in a ceasefire born of attrition, but guerrilla raids and proxy wars are still the rule of the land. Raven, the shaman from before, fans the fires of war by uh, using sabotage and uh, raids. He also uses illusory magic to make himself and his followers look like Union soldiers when attacking Confederates, or vice versa. You see, in the past, his entire tribe was murdered by settlers, and so he has vowed revenge. He has vowed to burn the USA and the CSA to the ground. Now, he's an interesting antagonist, and he has a lot of plots that you can use, but the fact that he has nigh single-handedly unleashed the Reckoners upon the world and ushered Earth into a, a state of Armageddon is a bit of a tall order to place on the revenge of but one man. The realm of pestilence is simultaneously the largest and the smallest realm. Physically, it encompasses only the state of Deseret, which we know as Utah today, and also Salt Lake City, which has been nicknamed the City of Gloom. It is so named because Dr. Darius Hellstrom the chosen pawn of pestilence, has turned that city into one giant factory, and it is from here that he rules his steampunk empire of the Wasatch Rail Company. It is here that he performs secret and horrific human experiments in his unceasing quest to find a way to revive his beloved wife who killed herself many years ago. Now, the real realm of pestilence is actually that of the new technology that is being introduced into the U.S. And it is spreading with it uh, pollution, pestilence, and putrescence, all masking under the guise of progress. It is famine that holds sway in California and the Pacific Northwest. You see, the California coast is now called the Great Maze after the Great Quake, and it is a series of islands. This has destroyed a lot of uh, potential farmland. And the Pacific Northwest is strangely gripped by a seemingly endless winter and food is scarce. The Reverend Ezekiel Grimm holds sway in what was once Los Angeles and is now called the City of Lost Angels. He and his followers are the only ones who seem to have food in this realm, and only those who are sworn to him are fed. Of course, 
dissenters disappear during the night, and the next day the stew pots are quite full. It is death that stalks the southwestern United States, the Sonoran Desert, and Death Valley, draining the life out of all who travel through it. It is only vultures that live well in these blasted wastelands. Now, Death's Chosen is Sergeant Jeremiah Stone, a Civil War officer who was so cruel that he was fragged by his own men. But he then rose up as a harrowed, a type of revenant, and beat the Manitou living inside his brain into submission. Now, he is Death's own assassin. He has the ability to teleport around the wastes and kill any hero who gains too much knowledge about the truth of the Weird West or gains too much power. Of course, using him in this way is a good way to decapitate your game just when it's getting good. Now, it is better to use Stone as a looming threat rather than an actual antagonist. And it is a good reason to, for the party to keep a low profile as they go about seeking answers in the Weird West. This section goes on to detail the rest of the Western USA. And this section is absolutely dripping with plot hooks. In fact, I find it very difficult to select a place in which to uh, set a campaign. I find that to be a good sign, as everything is very tempting. However, it is the cities of Deadwood in the Dakota Territories, it is Tombstone, Arizona, and it is Dodge City, Kansas that receive the most details and the most information. Now this makes sense as these places are some of the most iconic in the Western setting. However, anywhere that you choose, you won't go wrong in the setting of Deadlands. Now the next section is rules, and it is actually very small because this book is almost exclusively background details and setting information. However, in the rules section there's a few charts um, that are useful to take a look at, and it has the rules for playing as a harrowed. Uh, as I mentioned before, a harrowed is a type of revenant, but unlike the revenant who came back under the sheer force of their own will, a uh, a harrowed is a character who has been killed, and in a Manitou spirit, an evil spirit, is the one that rose them up. And it lives in their mind, and it is constantly trying to take over this character's mind. Because you see, there's nothing so terrifying as a slain hero who has returned to destroy everything he once loved and held dear. Perhaps this unfortunate individual is your character, who has returned from the grave in an undead state. Speaking of undead, the next 84 pages are dedicated to NPCs that your characters will meet. From the monstrous abominations, to human allies and enemies, and to famous people of the West, such as Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp, or perhaps even an undead Buffalo Bill. Now the creatures, there is a, for the creatures there is an enormous and varied selection. Now, the book never specifically states it, but I do feel that the creatures are divided into the four themes that I've discussed previously. For example, war gets its due with some truly horrific and frightening abominations that will threaten the player characters physically. But, some of these creatures are, in fact, the spawn of war itself. For example, there is the Black Regiment, which is an army of undead soldiers made up of both Union and Confederate. During great battles they will rise up and join the fray and turn this battle into a bloody stalemate. There is also the Glom, a creature that is made of the piled bodies of the war dead. And then pestilence can be seen in the creatures that bring some David Cronenberg body horror to the setting. There are more than a few creatures that will climb into your character's nose or mouth or, and lay eggs, or perhaps they will pierce his spine and control your character like a grim marionette. Now the ravenous werewolves, the ghouls and the wendigos, and the cannibal cultists of Ezekiel Grimm round out the offerings that are given to us by the force of famine. And then the innumerable undead wave the pale flag of death from the lowly zombie to the mighty Nosferatu to assorted ghosts who will laugh 
at any gunslinger's attempt to fill them full of lead. This is an aspect of the setting that I really like. You take the rough and tumble, square-jawed western hero, and suddenly he's going to piss himself because the creatures that he is unloading his six guns into, six guns that he has trusted his life to so far, are doing him no good. Another aspect that I like is that many of these creatures are from the assorted mythologies of North, Central, and South America. There are werewolves and vampires, yes, but there are also chupacabras, el cucuy, la irona of Mexico, and the carcajous, the chinooks, and the uctena of Native American lores. There are also mummies and liches, but they are Mesoamerican takes on these classic undead, and they only slightly resemble their fantasy counterparts. Now, the stat blocks in Savage Worlds are very small, and this allows each creature to have at least a decent ecology section in which they explain how to use the creature, what they do in the world, and where they live. Quite frankly, for some of them, I would like to see more, but all the ecology sections are at least passable. Now, um, as far as the art goes, most of it in the creature section is black ink over sepia. Now, this looks like something that you would see in a Monster Hunter's journal, or perhaps a newspaper sketch that is of the time period. It looks cool, but very, very few creatures are given full color art. And in fact, some of the creatures have no art at all. However, the setting on humans has just about everything you need in the form of an ally or an enemy. You have bandits and sheriffs, scientists and shamans, union secret agents, and just regular old townsfolk at your fingertips. Also detailed in the human section are the six rail barons of the rail companies that are engaging in quite literally corporate warfare in Deadlands. If you have played Shadowrun or Deus Ex or Cyberpunk, Imagine these as the mega corporations that rule the land. Each one is corrupt and cruel, but has their own distinct flavor. My personal favorite is Bayou Vermilion, and it is based out of New Orleans, and is led by a voodoo master named Baron Simone LaCroix. And he is building rails through Death's Realm of the Sonoran Desert because he uses zombie workers tireless zombie workers led by vampire uh, overseers who work only at night. And he is bolstering Santa Ana's armies with undead forces because Santa Ana wants to take back the southwestern United States because he has fallen in to worshipping an Aztec lich and this lich demands sacrifice. Like I said, Deadlands is more than brewing with bloody plot hooks. But, with all that said, what is the final verdict on the setting? Well, I think it's a very interesting setting, and it is rife with possibilities. But, combining horror, pulp westerns, and magic all together does run the risk of either being overwhelmingly jumbled and uh, discombobulated, or at worst, it runs the risk of being silly. Now, this is easy to avoid, and I suggest using the weird in the Weird West as a spice to lay it over the Western setting rather than using that as the full meal. Now, since this is a Savage World setting, all the rules are universal and can be translated into any other setting. Now, you can use the magic and the monsters that you find here, place it into a fantasy realm, and now you have a really cool dark fantasy setting like Ravenloft. Or, you can take Deadlands as it is, change nothing except the location, plop it down in foggy London town, and now you have a Victorian setting of terror by gaslight. So, all in all, at the end, I highly recommend hopping in your covered wagon and heading west to the Deadlands.